Okay. All right, Revelation chapter 3. We started in the last church there, the church at Laodicea. We will finish it up tonight. Um, I will not be here the next two weeks, but you will have Bible study. Brother Andrew Watt's going to do it. Uh, we won't be recording it. He's just going to do it in a different format, keep you over there in the fellowship hall. So you will continue with it, but, but those that are watching it, um, we will have a two-week break for you guys there. So, Revelation chapter 3, make sure we get through everything. Let's just go ahead. We won't review much. We'll just jump right in. Let's start in verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now you remember, we looked at that verse. That's the verse the Jehovah Witnesses and others try to utilize to say that Jesus is not God, that he was a created being. You'll see several different places where it has to do with Christ and creation. It calls him the firstborn over in Romans chapter 8. But he was the beginning of the body of Christ, but he is God, so thus he was never actually created. He was not the brother of Lucifer. He was not a false prophet. They used those verses. We looked over in Colossians 1, 15 through 18, where it says, Who is the image of the invisible God? The firstborn of every creature. You say, what's the firstborn of every creature? If you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All right? A creature is not what you see in the movies in the Bible. It's not the Loch Ness Monster or anything like that. A creature is a created being. It is something that, is, it, that has been created. So, if a person is saved, then they become that new creation in Christ. They become a member of his body. And the beginning of that was Christ himself. As he was resurrected, he also received a glorified body. Remember when he said, when they came to him, and Mary came to him, he says, touch me not, I've not yet ascended. So... Keep that in mind there. But people try to use that, and it is incorrect. We covered it in detail. Verse 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. So, we covered that as well, because what, and what we're looking at here, this is a message to the church at Laodicea. It's written, remember Pastor Payne talked about the time period that it was written in after the cross. It was written for that group that believed they were going into the tribulation period there. Remember you got the rapture right here. You got the seven years of tribulation and then you got the thousand year millennial reign of Christ there upon the earth. So... This message is written to this group going through this time period. And we've emphasized that each time because if you try to take the teachings of this and plug it into the body of Christ, it just doesn't fit. We don't need any hidden manna. We don't need to partake of the, the tree of life. We've already been made a member of his body there. We have the things that God has promised to us. So they couldn't be hot. They had to be hot or cold. They could not be lukewarm. Remember, we've covered this. During the tribulation period, you can't be kind of in and kind of out. People are going to have things written in their forehead. You can either, you either, you have the mark of the beast, the witnesses will have Jehovah written in their foreheads there. It's going to be one or the other. And what he was warning the church at Laodicea, knowing that the time, if you remember, we, we took this and we put it into a seven-year period. We went seven and 42 and 42. What book of the Bible has 42 chapters? Job. Good. I'm glad you all remembered it. All right. And much in the book of Job has to do, this prophetic has to do with the great tribulation period there, the, the last section of it there. So the tribulation period is also called the 70th week of Daniel. Very good. All right. So, the first part right here, you've got the witnesses, the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah. You've got the 144,000. We refer to this time period, it starts with an E. This is a time period of what? Anybody remember? E, evangelism. So once the witnesses 
uh, are killed and resurrected. The 144,000 go up as well. The last part of it, the Great Tribulation period, is a time of e, not evangelism, but e, e what? Evasion. Thank you. Of evasion. They're, remember, they're going to have to run. They that are on the house top. He says, don't stop for anything. They got that warning over in the book of Matthew there. So they are going to go. They'll be protected. They'll be fed with the manna, uh, given water, all those different things. And they have to endure to the end until Christ returns at this point right here. And he sets up his kingdom. So you have the rapture and the second coming of Christ. The rapture, we meet the Lord in the air. The second coming of Christ, he comes back and sets up his kingdom upon the earth after he does some house cleaning there, all right? On the earth, specifically with Babylon, all right? So, you've got that thing. He was warning them. Now, look back up there. I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold. I would thou wert hot, cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. And what this has to do with, you'll see as we read the rest of it, it has to do with those folks that were unwilling to give up everything and say, okay, we're going to trust the Lord. We're not going to give in to anything the Antichrist has during that time, all the things he's going to have out there. We're not going to be lukewarm in it. We're not going to try to ride both sides of the fence during that time. And God's warning them about that. Because remember, and I've been talking about it some in Sunday school, during this time period, are they allowed to have money and goods and wealth? No. During this time period, they're going to have it whether they like it or not because God's going to supernaturally give them things during this time as a representation and as a sign to all the other nations as they go out and reach them there. All right? All right. So with that, we will get to verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You know, when I first moved here, I preached out of this passage. And um, from being from down south, that word, there's a way we pronounce the word naked. I would pronounce it naked. And I said it, and I was reading that passage, and people in the congregation began to giggle. And, you know, I mean, it's like, I was like, what in the world is going on? I read it again. And I said the word again. And then everybody really began to giggle there, and they finally had to tell me, it's naked. No, it's, it's naked. I know it's pronounced that way, but we say it correctly down south, all right? So, poor, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and for the sake of where I live now, I say naked, so you can understand what I'm talking about there. Now, he says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. And white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thy eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. So we're going to take a little time and look at some passages that will help us to understand what he's saying to them. He's looking at them and he's saying that you are poor and miserable, wretched, blind and naked. And I will spew thee out of my mouth. Uh, the last thing we looked at was, we'll look over it real quick, Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32, where he says to him, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. So there is that acceptance and that rejection, that confession, that mouth confession there that is going to be made. And he says, you in your lukewarm state, you are going to be spewed out because you're not going to stick to it. You're not going to make it. If you're on both sides of the fence and it gets to this place where it gets hard and you can't have anything, you got to give it all up, he's saying you won't do it. So you cannot be lukewarm. So there's a great warning because of how difficult it's going to be during that time there. All right? So with that, I want you to turn. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. Now starting in chapter 24, I want you to remember this. Matthew 24 starts what's called the Olivet Discourse. And all that is, that just means that he's on the Mount of Olives and the disciples ask him, 
what about the events to come and the end of the world? So the discourse is him dispensing or speaking to them about these matters. So when you're Matthew 24 and 25, he's dealing specifically with the tribulation period and giving them some warnings there. So you get into Matthew 25, and he gives several parables here. We're going to jump down here to the last one. I think there's three in this chapter. But specifically, we want to look at this one. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Let me make mention of something to you. That you say, where is Christ right now? He's up there in his Father's throne. Sit thou here until I make thine enemies thy footstool. We're going to look at some specifics of when he's sitting, where he's sitting, the when of it, and when he's standing as well. So we're going to see some of those things there. But when you look at that right there, it's being made mention of during this time right here. It says, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, right here. He's going to come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Now, what would you say is the throne of his glory? This is one of those specific things, kind of like Sunday morning when I ask you about the latter times, okay? I want you to look at it and think about it for a minute, of what we studied and what we've looked at. And I haven't told you the answer to this, so don't think, oh, have you said this before? This is a figure it out thing. Of the places he's going to sit upon a throne, where is Christ going to sit upon a throne at this time? Who can guess? Huh? Okay, well... Close. Ain't come down yet. All right? He's going to come, and that throne he's going to sit upon is going to be upon the earth. Right? And it's going to be in Jerusalem. All right? And, but it's going to be called, and it's referenced to as the throne of... Whose throne is he going to sit upon that was established back here in history? Who was, there, who was Israel's... There you go. Let's say it loud. David. David. King David, their greatest king, he's going to come and sit upon the throne of David. That's going to be his rightful throne there. That is the throne that he wants for his people that he has promised for this time, to be Emmanuel, God with us, sitting upon his throne, establishing his kingdom with his people Israel. You say, well, isn't that us? No. Where are we going to be? Up here what we've been promised, in the heavenly places, ruling and reigning over the who? Over the angelic kingdoms there. That's why the Bible says we're going to judge angels one day in 1 Corinthians there. So you've got the two different uh, programs there represented. So right here, he's talking to his disciples. Verse 32, And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now watch what he says right here. For when I was a hungered, you gave me meat. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in naked. And ye clothed me, I was sick, and ye visited me, I was in prison, ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, and thirsty, and gave thee drink, and saw thee as a stranger, and took thee in, naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer, and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. All right, and then it's going to go on, and he's going to talk about those that didn't do it. And he shall say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. Because he's going to say to them, What? You didn't do all of these things. Now, if we go back here to Revelation chapter 3, you read that, that parable there, and then you look at what he says right here. And know it, verse 17, the middle part of it, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked there. All right? So that is going to be, think about it. 
that's kind of going to be their condition. And God's going to have to take care of them. Those folks following the Antichrist, they're going to have it all. Man, they're going to have it. They're going to be living it up. They're going to be partying. It's going to be Vegas all the time for those guys. But everybody else has got to endure to the end. But in the end, all those that were living it up are going to get judged. The righteous judge shows up. The Antichrist is placed into the, into the heart of the earth there, into the pit for a thousand years. And then there is a judgment there. So, thus... When you see in the book of, Laodice, of the, the church of Laodicea, there's a warning. Christ talked about it in Matthew 25, and now he's also telling this church at Laodicea. And he's not just telling them. Remember, of all the seven churches, all of that is going towards those tribulation saints going into this time period there. All right? So let me show you, a. let's read verse 18 here. He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Now you may say, it's like, well, if they don't have anything, how are they going to buy gold? But if you got the mark of the beast uh, and you don't take it, you can't buy and sell. How are they going to buy of me gold tried in the fire there? They're not talking about buying gold that is upon the earth. He's talking about Here's something I need to bring up to you so that you understand. All right? As we talk about Israel and how they are promised this kingdom upon the earth and we are promised these things out in the heavenly places, you also have to remember this because if not, you'll get confused with it. If you take the book of Matthew, in the book of Matthew, you see a phrase called the kingdom of heaven. And in the four gospels, the kingdom of heaven, it's only used in the book of Matthew because in the book of Matthew, you see the Messiah back here as being king. Remember, you got four Gospels. In Matthew, he was king. In Mark, he was what? Does anybody know? He represented a... Anybody get it? Try it. Servant. You're right. See? Speak up, baby. All right. So Luke. Luke was a doctor. Luke, he represented that the Messiah would also be a... Who do doctors work on? Patients. Those patients are humans. Those humans are sometimes called men. <laughs> okay? So the Messiah would be the king. He would be a servant during this time period all the way up to the cross. He would be a man. He would come in the form of a man. And very importantly, the book of John shows him he, that he would also be who? He would be God. All right? That's why you have four Gospels. It shows him represented in those four things. You go and you look at the cherubim. We'll see it here in the weeks to come. It's got four faces on there. You've got four Gospels. We'll look at the significance, significance of the number four there. So with this, let's come back to it. Oh, no, no i got to finish what I was saying. So this kingdom of heaven, that new Jerusalem, that city is going to come down out of heaven. And you see references where it talks about them laying up treasure in heaven where moth nor rust doth corrupt. And then it's going to come down here to the earth. You're still going to have the heavens up there and eventually you have the new heaven and the new earth. But he is saying there are things you can have here. Just like those people that die during the tribulation period, they get their heads cut off because they won't take the mark of the beast and they're up there. Where are they at? Anybody remember where they're at up there? Nope, Abraham's bosom's down here in the center of the earth. Up there is the other place. It says they are three words. Under the... Nope. They're under the... Starts with an A. Altar, thank you. They are there under the altar saying, Lord, how long before you come back? So you remember, the group that's going to be with him, you got the group that comes out of heaven, the group that comes out of Abraham's bosom, and the group that endures to the end. They're going to come. They'll be, it all represents the Jews there, and they are all going to come with him, and they're going to go out, and they're going to reach all those Gentile nations for that thousand years, and they'll be under the new covenant there. So... Now, with that, we are, let's look, let's look at that gold for a minute and see what, now I, and I pointed that out to you because when you talk about heavenly things, you're like, well, I thought they got the earth. 
It's going to make reference to the heavens with them as well, but it's talking about their treasures there and what's going to come down. We go up and we stay up. We're not going to come back and be the mayor like some people teach. We've been promised that we're going to judge angels. Judge angels, we are seated together with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus there. So with that, we come to, let's go to 1 Peter. Uh, 1 Peter chapter th- 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance. You say, the lively hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's right. He was resurrected and he ascended and they are waiting on him to come back here. All right. So you've got and to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Okay? That's not what's reserved for us. That's what's reserved for them there, those that are going to go through that tribulation period there, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season... If need be, you're in the heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. See, one of the reasons we know you can look at that last phrase, at the appearing of Jesus Christ. At the second coming, he appears. At the rapture, He don't appear to anybody on the earth. We go up to the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. When you look up in the clouds, can you see what's above it? No. You can have a thunderstorm here. You go up in an airplane, get through the clouds, you can see the sun. It's a whole different program on the other side, but people upon the earth cannot see through the clouds. So, that it might be found of the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. He talks about their manifold temptations and all that they are going to go and the things that are reserved in heaven for them that is going to be brought down to them and is going to allow them to partake of all of that wealth and abundance that they're going to have as he brings that back for them and lifts the curse of the earth there. All right. So let's look at another one here. Let's go to uh, Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. And verse 15. Now, uh, let's just go ahead and read it. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, uh, and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits or my goods. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods. Lay up for many years. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. And God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall these things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So there's a parable of a man that his business and his farming and his wealth got to a place where he couldn't store it. So he tore those barns down, built bigger ones, so that he would have room to put it all in there and get to a place where that he says, okay, I don't have to worry anymore. I have enough where I can, and you know, really, if you look at verse 19, and I will say to my soul, soul that has much goods laid up for many years, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. What word would we use to describe verse 19 today? What does that sound like? See, you young people don't know, because you ain't thinking about it. Was it? Not just relax. Something specific. A time period of life that people can in what retirement? retirement. Isn't that what people do with retirement? Did y'all have it? Okay, all right, good. Say it, man. Y'all get some right answers back there. All right, so that sounds like retirement. Is it wrong for us today 
to lay up money so that when we get older, we can live off of it and take some ease? Now, if you look at that verse, is retirement allowed or not allowed? Well, you good Bible students that understand that what is that verse talking about here, here, or here? What is that warning? Is it dealing with the age of grace, the tribulation period, or the kingdom? What's that? Tribulation? Absolutely. If they, remember, what did I tell you before? Can they have stuff here? No. Can they, are they going to have a lot of stuff here? Yes. We'll talk about this later, because here we have liberty. You see, we are allowed to have a retirement. People that save up for a retirement, are, God doesn't look at them and call them thou fool. You know when you're a fool is when you think you can retire during the tribulation period. You don't retire in the tribulation period. You endure to the end. Your retirement for them is right here. God says, I have provided your retirement. You don't save up for it. I save up for it. In the age of grace, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. If he soweth bountifully, he shall reap. And if he soweth sparingly, he shall reap sparingly. That's the principle for today. But for right here, God, he says, you don't have to save up for your own retirement. You don't do it that way. I'm going to take care of it for you here. So thus, you have this parable and you have a judgment that says, Thou fool, this night thou, thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So you can lay up treasure in heaven that comes back down for that group, not you, them. But if you, they were to try to establish it themselves, he says, nope, that's not how you do it. So you have to understand where it fits and where it doesn't fit. There are people that look at this and tell people, it's like, you're not right. I heard people say, you're not right with God because you don't have enough faith and you're saving up for your retirement. I heard people preach that. From that passage, you know what they are? Wrong. <laughs> I mean, just wrong as wrong can be. Why? Because 1 Timothy 6 says in the age of grace, it says charge them that are rich in this world. It doesn't say tell them to sell all they have. It doesn't tell them to not take care of their barns and, and, and get rid of everything. It says they're allowed to be during this time. Do you know a person can be wealthy and right with God today? Does that sound weird? Come on, be honest. Are you allowed to be wealthy and right with God? Can you be wealthy and righteous? Does it sound a little weird? Come on, be honest with me. Now, maybe y'all been here long enough and I've got it in your heads. But most people would say wealthy and righteous just don't go hand in hand. The love, money itself is not the root of all evil, the love of money. And it says, those that would be rich, those that are covetous, those that look at what other people have, but those that are good stewards. You know, you know how you become wealthy? Is you put money away little by little and you invest it and you let it grow over a period of time and let compound interest take its course. And yeah, you know, I mean, I've got a thing I can show you where if you handle your money better, you'll have greater opportunity to be a better Christian. I'm not going to show it to you tonight. I'm going to show it to you later because I'm going to do it in Sunday school. All right? But it makes so much sense. It'll make those people that take stuff out of context. It will make them step back and say, wow, have I been just been stupid all my life because I've listened to what other people have said and I haven't let the word of God be the authority. It doesn't matter if they're Baptist or they're charismatic or they're Catholic. Anybody that takes the word of God out of context and spiritualizes it and tries to make it say what they want it to say, they are wrong automatically. They might mean well, but I know a lot of people that mean well. That don't mean they do well. Okay? If somebody, if, if, you know, if I need my appendix out and somebody means well and said, I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night, I think I can handle this, they might mean well, but... I don't want them working on me. You know why? They probably ain't going to do well. Mm -mm. Certain people you don't want working on your car, 
working on your house, especially working on your body. <laughs> you want somebody that's trained and knows what they are doing there. All right, we got to hurry. We got to hurry. All right, because we got to get to this raiment stuff here. I want to try to cover all of these things that it mentions here. All right, so back to Revelation chapter 3, back up to, ver back down to verse um. 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. There, we know where their wealth comes from. White raiment that thou mayest be clothed there. So I'll read you a verse. Revelation 16, 15 says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Remember poor, wretched, miserable, blind, naked? Part of that nakedness is representing the fact they don't have that robe of righteousness that they're promised. Remember, they get a new name. They get that robe of white righteousness, that white garment there, uh, representing who they are uh, in Christ, believing on the Messiah, that he's going to come back and take care of business for them there. All right, let's move quickly here because I want to get to this. And it says, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. So he says, I counsel thee. He's given them some instructions. He's given them some counsel, some advice. Understand where your wealth's really going to come from. Keep your white garment. Keep yourself pure, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Because they've got to be able to see what's coming. These people during this time period have got to look past what's going on on the earth. they got to look past to this right here and trust it and believe it regardless of how bad it gets for them there. So let me show you a passage here real quick. We'll go to John, uh, John chapter 9. John chapter 9, verses 5 through 7. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Obviously, Christ is speaking. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. Remember, Christ came and he was healing the blind. It was part of showing that he was the Messiah. He healed them of leprosy and, and you know, ailments and all the different things that they had there. But there was also that issue of their blindness. You had the Pharisees when Christ was upon the earth. They were the most blind because they had the most knowledge, but yet they still rejected Christ as the Messiah. You're going to have those that are going to reject him. Their faith in them believing apart from what all they're going through, is going to be very critical for them during this time. Now, we can relate that principle to us today. We live our lives today for the life to come and what God has promised to us, but specifically for them. they Watch this. They are going to see so many things. They're going to see the judgments. They're going to see the miracles. They're going to see the bad guys do miraculous things. They're going to watch the Antichrist be resurrected from the dead, just like the two witnesses were. They're going to see all that stuff. So he says, hey, you can't be blind. You've got to wash your eyes. You've got to let them aside. You've got to be able to see this clearly so you don't give in to it there. And for them, the seeing is so important because of all the stuff that they are going to see during that time there. And for some of it, though, they're going to have to just step back and, and believe and trust in what is right and what they have been taught there. So back to Revelation chapter 3 and verse uh, 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Now, I want to make sure I get you verse 20. This thing of chastening, I'll give you, you can just write this down, Hebrews 12, 1 through 11. We won't cover it, but it talks about chastening there in Hebrews, and it's specifically dealing with the tribulation period there. But verse 20 says, Behold, he says, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him, and he with me. Now, you, I, I, they, they make pictures of this, and most people take this verse, 
and say, okay, this is the Lord knocking at the door of a sinner asking him to come in that they might be saved. But let's stop for just a minute. Who is this being written to? The, the church at Laodicea? Those are the good guys, right? He's not writing this to the lost, right? He's writing this to those people during that time that are going to go through. He looks at them after he talks about chastening, after he talks about the council. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. We understand that he's going to return right there at that point. Let me get it back up here. But this is not a reference to him knocking and somebody allowing him into their life right here because he's talking to the church at Laodicea. And what do they have to do? They have to endure until the end to be saved. They have to be there until the Messiah comes or reject the beast and have their head chopped off. Then they get to come back with him there. So for these guys, it is about their works to get there. They're not forgiven based upon their works. Nobody's forgiven outside of the finished work of the cross. But they get their forgiveness based upon the new covenant of Jeremiah 31 and 31 there in that passage right through there. And the promise is given to them for that time. So when he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. When they see him up here, he's going to be standing. We're going to see down the road here, and I've mentioned it to you before, there's going to be a time period where people are looking up and they're going to see him up there, standing, waiting to come, waiting to come and bring his judgment there. But to the church, he's telling them, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. He's going to sit right here. He's going to be standing right up here waiting to come. Let me show you an example of that. If we were to go back to the book of Acts, chapter 7, and you have Stephen just going off in this passage to these people. They are rejecting the kingdom still. They're rejecting the Messiah. They've rejected Peter and those guys. And you get this whole message, but you get all the way down here to the end. I think it's in, um, starting verse 55. But he, well, verse 54, here's their reaction. But when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. They were so upset with his message, they began to bite him. I mean, you ever seen a two-year-old throw a tantrum and bite somebody? These are adults that are biting Stephen here and getting, ready to, and getting ready to stone him and kill him. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. You know what he was saying? Back over here, during this time, Christ has already ascended. You got a little bit of time over here. He looks up and sees him standing right there. He's saying, You know what? He's standing. And when he's standing, guess what he's getting ready to do? He's getting ready to come back and throw down. And he's telling all them boys this get ready to kill him. He said, guess what I see? <laughs> Y'all do to me what you want to. But he's fixing to come and clean house. Remember, they didn't know anything about Romans through Philemon yet. That was a mystery hidden God before the foundation of the world. Saul hadn't been saved yet. The transition's getting ready to start. This, Acts chapter 7 ends the kingdom period there. And the Jews are going to be brought down, the middle wall of partition done away with. Jew and Gentile get saved alike. But as soon as the body of Christ goes out, the Jews are going to be elevated again. That's where we get the 144,000 from, the two witnesses. And they're going to go out and reach all those Jews during that time. Just like, remember, over in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 1, he said, Jerusalem, he said you're going to go out and reach Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. That's what the plan was for the witnesses for this time period. They're going to go out and get all those Jews and get them together, rally them here for the coming of Christ so they can go out and reach all the nations uh, during the kingdom there. 
So when Stephen looked up and he told them, I see him standing. He didn't say sitting. He said standing. In the end of his life, while he was being bitten and spit upon and getting ready to be stoned, he's looking at them saying, you do what you want to to me. He's coming because he believed that this was going to take place during this time period. It was going to begin right here and start on and roll through there. They didn't know about the age of grace because it was a mystery there. So, uh, let's see. Finish, let's finish it off here. Revelation chapter 3. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Sit thou here with me till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Then he's going to stand up. So he was standing, and then all this is taking place. He's sitting right now. <laughs> There's coming a day he's going to get up. And when he gets up, it's going to be bad for some people on the earth right here. We're going to be glad that we're right here and didn't have to go through any of this. And that crowd that rejects him, takes the mark of the beast and lives it up, they're going to have to deal with him as he stands and comes down and cleans house and takes care of business. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches there. So we will begin with chapter 4 here in a few weeks and um, continue our study and roll on. So, wow, we're right on. Boy, I did good tonight, man. Look at that. Boy, 731. Boom, shakalaka. All right, let's pray. Lord, we are thankful, Lord, for your goodness to us. We're thankful for the Word of God. Lord, we're thankful that we can look and see these events that are going to come. Lord, we can look back into the history of what was being prophesied about what was going to come. And Lord, as we have the Word of God, we can look to see what's coming after us. Father, we're thankful, Lord, for the rapture. Lord, we're thankful, Lord, for what's been given to us in grace, that it's not by our works, that, Lord, we get to be placed into the body of Christ. We get a glorified body. Lord, we get to go up and meet the Lord in the air and be judged according to our works, not our sins. Lord, that we might receive a reward and go out into the principalities and powers in heavenly places and rule and reign and judge the angels, Lord, as you have promised for us to do. But Lord, we're, I think we're going to get to see what's going to go on during the tribulation period in the kingdom as well. And Lord, to see you receive your glory and what is rightfully yours. So Lord, for us today, Lord, help us to live in such a way that you are our head. And we are the body. Lord, help us to serve you and live for you each day. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you guys for coming.